Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to Our Issues Birmingham. Today's guest uh, needs no introduction, but she is Lily Ledbetter, uh, and she is quite a historical figure in the state of Alabama for a variety of reasons. Uh, she has a federal act named after her called the Lily Ledbetter Act, and I'd like to welcome you to our show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well. I'm just glad you came down. She lives in Jacksonville, Alabama. My uh, pleasure. Uh, uh, are you a, a JSU graduate? Well, I'm a JSU fan. I used to work, be the uh, financial aid assistant uh, director in the financial aid office for many years. and um, But I, that was the best job I ever had. And the young people kept me, they kept me young too. So, yeah. But I I've, I've went on to greener pastures. So what Lily is, uh, mostly known for, although it's not a fair, uh, it doesn't define her in total, is equal pay for women in jobs that are the same as men. Uh, and I'm going to let her tell her story uh, right now and tell us how she ended up in this situation and how she ended up writing this book. Thank you. So Thank you. It's the floor a, is yours. Good. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. and. And I like sharing my story because each time I do, it usually helps someone else. And oftentimes it helps many people. And I love it when the men tell me, thank you for doing this for my mother and my wife and my daughters. So it's an ongoing process too. And it's something that I should never have had to do. But being the Lily Ledbetter I am and the person I am, I found out after working. It's a great name, by the way. Thank you. 19 <laughs> years, real Southern, 19 <laughs> years um, at, in a tire manufacturing as a supervisor and an area manager in production. And, I found out. And we can out, say Goodyear. Yeah, that's right. It was Goodyear. I worked for Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Gadsden, Alabama. And I was there for 19 years and had been in various management positions and found out that they were paying me 40% less than the white men doing the same job. It was the exact same job, just a different shift. That factory ran seven days and seven nights a week, and uh, we had four area managers in that position, and someone gave me a tip. They put Lily, Lily and three men, and I knew when I saw it that it was correct because my pay was an odd number, and it went right to the, to the dollar. But the first thing I thought about when I saw that note was my overtime, how much I had lost, how much this had cost me through the years. How many years were you there? I was 19 years then. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not right. Um, I'm two years away from retirement. I can't let this go. And I thought about it, I was so humiliated. I was embarrassed. I looked around, you know, like you do when you fall to see who's looking at me, who gave me this note, who furnished me this information so that I could go ask, how many people know this? Is everybody out in this factory laughing behind my back? You know, are they making fun? And so I, I just was so humiliated. I wanted to run and hide. What year but was I this? couldn't. That really? was 1998. I couldn't because I still had bills at home. I still had mortgage. I still had car payments, and I still needed to work those extra two years before I re could retire. And um, I couldn't quit. I had to work. So I mustered up enough of courage and got on the floor to do my 12-hour shift, and then it hit me like a ton of brick. This is not only my pay and my overtime, but it's my retirement. It's my contributory retirement. And it's also my 401k, and today it's my Social Security. So I couldn't let it go. I thought about that the next eight hours of working time. And when I left, I got home, I explained to my husband what I had learned. I said, I must file a charge with the Equal Employment Commission in Birmingham unless you object. But I will warn you that if I start, we'll probably be in this for eight years. I knew there's not a quick fix. I read headlines. 
I read statistics and I knew that cases like mine, they don't settle very quickly unless they're offered a decent settlement and people can go on with their life. But I said, I can't let it go because I worked overtime in the position I had. We got time and half, double and triple, and it was nothing for me to work a two-month schedule straight 12 hours every night of the week. Were you getting double? I was getting double and triple. And, but, but it was it at was a different less, rate but it was less. than the male. That's right. It was less. If my pay figured out to be $20 an hour and theirs is already 40 you can see what double and tripling <clears throat> that does to you and how much difference it made in my pay. And it's not, I didn't want no favoritism. I just wanted to be in the ballpark. I wanted to be within reason. Reason. They didn't have to pay each one of us X number of dollars or $20 or whatever, but we should, I should have been closer than what and I was. Did you confront your uh, immediate supervisors initially? I had already tried that. I filed a uh, sexual harassment. Uh, well, I didn't file a charge. I filed a, a, a complaint in the early 80s. Uh, one of the Me Too's, and uh, I knew how they react. Uh, they they really didn't like the women in the plant. I think they only hired us because they had to. Um, and then when I had asked uh, my supervisor, my manager had made an appointment and wanted to discuss my pay because, like I said, I was two years away from retirement. I wanted to get my uh, pay as high as I could because that's what my retirement would be based on. And he said, oh, you're just listening to too much BS from the guys, and got up and walked out of his office and left me sitting there. And when I asked for help in the early 80s for, on sexual harassment, the guy ran out of the office, out of HR, and he said, oh, Lillian Lothar's into it, and started a big investigation. That was not what I asked for. I just asked, could you please, I don't care where you put me, move me, move me away from this guy. He's got his hands on me. He's talking sex all the time. I only wanted that, but they blew it all out. So I knew when I got that note, the only choice I had for help was to go to equal employment. All right, hold that thought. We'll, we'll talk about that when we come back. Okay. This is Our Issues Birmingham. We're visiting with Lily Ledbetter. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Our Issues Birmingham. We're talking with Lily Ledbetter. Uh, and she's sharing with us her life story, uh, which is fascinating. And uh, as a result of the unequal pay she was receiving at Goodyear, she did, in fact, file an EEOC claim because you're required to do that before you can actually get to the court system. So how long did that drag on once you filed that? Well, uh, I have to for the benefit of the Equal Employment Commission in Birmingham, I filed my charge and the lady worked with me for three hours, pulling out of me all the gory details. And she said, when I got up to leave, she said, these folks have been messing with you for a long time. In nine months, they called me and they said, you've got one of the best cases we've ever seen, but we're shorthanded and we're backlogged. If you find an attorney that will represent you, you might get to federal court quicker. So that's what I proceeded to do was find my own attorney that could take my case on a contingent basis, which they would have got 50% if I, whatever I got. And um, but that's another sad story too. Yeah. But I did find an attorney for, in a firm here in Birmingham, Alabama, that was wonderful and they stayed with me for nine years and represented me. And they, we went all the way to the Supreme Court. May I ask John you? Goldfarb was okay. my attorney. Uh, Mike Quinn was second, oh, we worked know. with him, and then uh, it was a Wiggins firm. Wiggins Pentesis now. Right, yes, it changed names, and in fact, Goldfarb's part of the firm name. So for those of you that don't know, you have to exhaust administrative remedies, then you go to federal court, and that's what Lily did. And when she says her case went to the Supreme Court, she's talking about Supreme Court of the United States, the final law of the land. And she lost that case but she lost the case on an oddball technicality that basically said she had waited too long. But the rest of the story, as a result of what she did, and I get chill bumps just saying this, 
our United States Congress enacted the Lilly Ledbetter Act so that this wouldn't happen again. So explain how that came about. That was, these um, uh, could I give you a little background too Please. about the federal court in my home county with a jury of seven people on that federal court. They awarded me $3.8 million. Of course, Goodyear appealed and we went to 11th Circuit and they denied it and then we appealed and but we went to the Supreme Court in November of 2006, but and, we didn't get the verdict. That's in Washington, D.C. Yeah, and the Supreme Court said, you snooze, you lose. Yeah, they said we waited too long, but really basically uh, there was a little technicality in there that we couldn't overcome in the Supreme Court and that's why Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was so dynamic with her uh, Descent. Descent, because she read every word loud and clear, and she hit the nail on the head. She said, this is not right. She said, this is not the way it is, and I should have had that case. And looking back, I believe had Sandra Day O'Connor still been there, I would have gotten that award. And what we was would, the vote? Um, five to four. Oh. Five to four. And had Sandra Day O'Connor been there, I would have probably won and should have because the Wiggins firm and John Goldfarb and all of the attorneys there that worked on that case, they stayed with me faithfully. And uh, they, we were offered such minimum amounts along the way for settlement. It was almost another joke. And I, I, I just finally told Mr. Goldfarb, I said, if you want to take it, you think it's reasonable, I'm okay. But we never did. We never got a decent offer. And because that case should have gone on, everybody still talks about it all over today. That case should have just zipped on through the Supreme Court like grease lightning, so to speak, because it was really, I filed that charge the minute I found out. And in the past, that law had always been interpreted based on paycheck accrual rule. It had always been, and it should have stayed that way. That's what we put it back to be and to where it's more clear. And uh, I mean, I was very fortunate all the way. I had a good Oops. lawyer and I had a good judge. I had Judge U.W. Clement. Oh, yeah, I best. couldn't have gotten a better uh, turn, a lawyer or t attorney. No I doubt. mean, but Mr. Goldfarb's firm, I think they have a half a million dollars in my case. They never got a dime, yeah. never got a dime, and I never got a dime. A lot of people think I got 30000 or I got something else. I didn't get a penny. When, when the Supreme Court ruled that it was untimely, how, who introduced the legislation that changed the law that now allows the equal pay to apply? The uh, uh, Congressman George Miller from California, uh, the Labor and um, uh, uh, let's say Labor and Education Committee was working on it, and but the uh, simultaneously with but the, the but the House and the uh, Senate both was working. And um, President Obama was part of it, S Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. I got to know him and got to be really close with him before he passed. Uh, it was just awesome. And, and Senator Barbara Mikowski, uh there were just so many, many people Did that worked on it. Did you get a chance to talk to the uh, Congress? I did. I testified twice in the House. I testified twice in the uh, Senate, and uh, I found out each time that they the they have an attorney there that argues against me. They nitpick my uh, case and they nitpick my testimonies and my depositions, uh, and I have to stand up. But I would uh, ask for permission from the chairman, and I'd clarify it. So the man, the attorney who came the first two times, he said, "I'll never come back." He said, I do not want to go up against you again. <laughs> and then the other two I got, they really didn't know what was going on. And, and they sort of got, uh, uh, I sort of overpowered them, I think. But this is a case that when you stop and look at it, it's not just mine. It belongs to everybody. It's everybody. And it works everybody. both ways. It should be gender neutral. But you know, the thing that I, I've got to not. tell your audience too right now, what I'm the proudest of that the sponsors and co-sponsors for the Ledbetter bill was Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. Everybody co-sponsored it. 
I mean, it wasn't just one party or the other, and it was all of them, and it was voted into law. Now, the problem was we had to convince enough of the others that wasn't on board to start with why it was so critical and so important to get the votes. It took 18 months to get that bill passed. But it happened. But hold, it happened. It's that, history. You are history. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. This is Our Issues Birmingham. Don't go away. Welcome back to Our Issues Birmingham. Uh, the, histor the historical aspects of our guest today cannot be overstated. Uh, she's made a difference and she has reduced that to writing and she's written a book about it. She's not here to promote the book necessarily to sell books, but her story is worth hearing and worth reading about. So is this your book right here? Grace, it is. Grace and Grit. My Fight for Equal Pay at Goodyear and Beyond. Uh, the writer that I had to help me write the book is Lanier Isom. She lives here in Birmingham. Any and relation the, to uh, Chervis? And the photograph is, uh, yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And the photograph was done by a Birmingham photographer. So that originally started out to be uh, an article for a magazine, which is no longer in print, but uh, it turned out then when I got the book contract um, that we used the same photo, mm -hmm. and she, she used the same grace and grit because she and liked it because I used to do ballroom dancing. I was a com really? com competitor for eight years going all the way to Grand Nationals, and so that's where the grace came about, and of course the grit was... You still dancing? I, I'm just social, just mm -hmm. social. But the <laughs> book also is in Japanese. That's another oh, yeah. thing, oh yeah. The attorney from uh, Japan, he and his son, who is an attorney, they flew to Alabama, and uh, they stayed with uh, all of us. Lanier and I drove them around for a while, and we met in John Goldfarb's office with all of his folks, and we made photos, and then uh, uh, they wanted to see Possum Trot, where I grew up, which was all grown up in weeds now, and they wanted to see Goodyear, so we went um, over and got as close to the factory as we could for them to see the big plant in Gadsden and got some photos for them. You mean as close as you could because you, you're not allowed there anymore? That's true. That's true. When they had their <laughs> hey, when they had their big anniversary, you everybody, didn't get I didn't get invited. I didn't get invited. I sure didn't. I didn't get invited. Sicilian? They're carrying a garage. They did. That's directly did. at me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'll Sicilian. tell you. But I'll tell you. I get a lot of calls from a lot of. Uh, uh, bosses I had and a lot of the uh, ones who, who did me right. And then I did, uh, I get a lot of calls from a lot of the union guys and gals. So this is not about necessarily, as a matter of fact, it sounds like it's not about Gadsden people at all. It's, it's, it's about corporate. It's corporate, it's corporate. It, it's bigger than it, what's it going on in Etowah County. And, and you see too what I've learned, uh, Tommy, in my travels, women in this United States, we're outliving our spouses on average by 10 years. Yes, I know And the if for my that. retirement is low, look how much money Goodyear has saved in my retirement because they well, lowered, my they, pay was so low. Did they change in the wake of um, mm -hmm. Now, my, my retirement, you, you would life if you heard how much my Goodyear retirement is for 20 years. So the law that was enacted wasn't retroactive? No, well, it was not retroactive. I didn't get anything. In fact, Congress tried to get the, um, the price so that the Social Security Administration could up my Social Security retirement based on the 60000 which is for the two years back pay that I didn't get. Uh, but they couldn't do it, and then they contacted Goodyear, the top officials out of Washington did, and asked them to live up to their moral values and raise my retirement to reflect that 60000 which was all, you know, when you go back for equal pay, you can only go back two years. Mm -hmm. So they won't, and I got 30000 per year, no, re, no overtime, no extra benefits or anything. Yeah, you know, when I was, women uh, uh, have been treated horribly historically. I mean, and it's biblical, really it goes way, 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 That's way true. back. Uh, but at a time when I was teaching criminal law and criminal procedure, I, I would have to read cases from the 70s, mm -hmm. which I consider to be fairly recent, right. where women weren't allowed to serve on juries, for example, right. in the state of Louisiana in the 70s. Right. Uh, it's just incredible to me 
uh, that those sorts of discriminations existed. I, I'm not that naive um, to, to believe that your story is not real or that those things aren't real, but they do probably still go on, unfortunately, they do. and they it's do. sad. The Me Too uh, thing is still, it, it brought out a lot. And, and you know, the, the thing too, when you start talking about equal pay, um, it's now in Hollywood. They're recognizing that they're not oh, getting yeah. it equally. Well, that means a lot. It, it, a lot of people say, well, oh my gosh, you made $200,000, makes you want another hundred. Well, that's not the way it that's is. If the, he got it, she should logic. get it too. Well, you, what, what, what are you doing now these days? I travel. I'll be in New York next week speaking to a wonderful group and, up in New York. And talking. And talking. About and, your story. Uh, I'm about my story and the journey and what you can do to not let it happen and how best way to handle it. And I'm, I'm old school, I believe. I, before I went with Goodyear, I was a manager for H&R Block, managing 16 locations. I believe in the chain of command. You should be able to go into your immediate superior, and if that don't work out, you say, well, uh, Tommy, that didn't, I didn't agree with you. I'm going to the HR department, and you should go. That's the way it should work, and they should handle it. They should listen, and even if they don't agree with me, Goodyear should have handled it. I've been asked in major interviews, people would stop and say, why on earth would a major corporation want the kind of negative publicity you give them? I said, you'll have to ask them. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you. I think I'm gonna have you back. Great. For you to tell our audience how to go about doing what you did. Okay. Okay. This is Our Issues Birmingham. This has been a delightful show. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next Sunday.